Hello everyone and welcome to another episode here on the Hacks to Knits channel. My name's Deanna and I am an American living in Okinawa, Japan. I am so glad you're here with me today. I thought uh, maybe I would take out some of my own knitting and work on some of my knitting while we talk. I uh, see a lot of YouTubers do this and I always thought, oh, there's no way I could do that because I, uh, I do look at my knitting a lot instead of at the camera. But I thought maybe today I'd give it a try because I do find that whenever the camera turns on, my anxiety level goes up a little bit. And oftentimes things that I had meant to talk about, I don't talk about, or I rush through them just because I'm a little bit nervous when the camera turns on. So I thought we would try this today and see how things go. Um, you guys can let me know whether it works or doesn't work. Uh, what I'm working on right now is actually that hexagon cable blanket. It's not much of a blanket yet, but that's what I'm working on today. I've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now. This was the pattern by Knit Picks um, that I had very carefully spent a lot of time picking out yarn for and then went to buy the pattern and lo and behold the pattern was no longer available on the Knit Picks website. So that was a big disappointment. I was able to uh, finally go online and find the pattern. It's available through a book on Amazon called The Wood Smoke Collection, The Wood Smoke Cable Collection. Um, but of course by the time I had found that pattern available as a book, I had already kind of just hacked the pattern. So I spent a few minutes looking at pictures of the pattern of the finished products on Ravelry and looking at the um, error, error corrections and figured I could just do this myself. So I just kind of sketched out what I thought the cable pattern was on some graph paper um, and then just cast on and started knitting. So that's where I am. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to share any of that process with you because I'm pretty sure that falls under copyright infringement. Uh, I did make a little modification from the pattern in the border. Uh, it looked like the pattern had an I-cord border put on and for whatever reason, you know, I think I know how to do a thing and then I try to do a thing and it comes out wrong and then I have to go look up how to do a thing. <laughs> That happens a lot in my uh, knitting especially, and I thought for sure I know how to make an I-cord border. I've done a million of them, uh, but it just wasn't working out. And in the process of going through and Googling and looking for I-cord borders, I found this website. I'm going to link it below because I can't remember the name of it right now, but it said like better improved I-cord border. And, um, as best I can tell, I, I can't make heads or tails of what's going on in this pattern. I have to like literally read it every single line, but it's making a really nice border on the edge of this. I don't think you'll be able to see that at all, but it does look like a nice little I-cord border. Um, as best I can tell, it's a combination of uh, like a slip stitch edge and a couple of slip stitches, you know? I don't really know. I don't know what's going on, but I like the way it's turning out, and so I will link below the um, the website where I found the tutorial on how to make this nice border. So, what is my plan for this project? Ugh, this this is why you can't knit in YouTube. <sighs> tangles. Uh, most of the time, these tangles are the result of having two very curious cats who like to get into my knitting. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't blame them today. Today, the problem is that I had a very long, long tail left over when I cast on, and I should have just snipped it off, but I didn't. Oh well, this is where we are today. Um, so I mentioned that I spent a long time kind of picking out yarn for this pattern, and I'm not really in love with it. I'm not in love with my choice. So the reason it took me so long was I was feeling, uh, uh, a little thrifty, maybe a little frugal. I just didn't really want to spend a whole bunch of money on a large blanket, uh, which may have been a mistake, but I also had a husband that was asking me to pretty please knit him an acrylic blanket so that he didn't have any itchy wool. And I did, I did buy uh, some acrylic yarn, but I don't feel like it's doing a lovely job of showing off the stitch pattern. It's a little bit darker than what I wanted. Um, I think I just have to push through a few more rows 
before I really make a decision on this. And for those of you who are kind of wondering, this raw edge here, I'm planning on eventually picking up and doing an applied eye cord border when I'm all done here. So we'll see how this pattern ends up. It may or may not, I don't know. That's a nice thing about knitting though, isn't it? Is like when things don't work out, you can just pull them apart and save that yarn for another project. Maybe it won't make a nice blanket, but it will make a nice something else. Cat bed, sweater, who knows? Uh, I'm not calling it quits yet though. <clears throat> We're not quite done with this product. We'll see how it goes. So yeah, I think that's all I want to say about this project for today. I am, of course, wearing my finished object from last week. This is the Night Shift by Andrew Mowry. Now, officially, with all of the ends woven in and blocked, the nice thing about a project like this, um, it's a shawl, which you want to block, but you don't have to do it quite as carefully and as lovingly as you do some of those lace shawls that need lace patterns opened up. In fact, all I did for this project I soaked it in some warm water, squeezed out as best I could all of it, and just chucked it over the railing outside and let the weight of the water pull it open and pull it flat. And I just love the way it turned out. Talk about easy, easy blocking. And something I'm really loving about this pattern is the wrong side. Okay, check this guys out. The wrong side of this looks awesome. Like it looks just as good as the front side, I think. And I am totally in love with wearing this, which is awesome because this project, oh, look, can you see that? Little pulled ends. This is also another problem of having kittens who climb on my knitting, is their little claws get in the pulled ends, no matter how many times I trim their claws. It's okay, I can fix that. So, I'm just really happy with the way this turned out because it was a bunch of my hand spun yarn that I never ever thought to pick up and knit with. I was always sort of hesitant about how the imperfections and the, the thickness and thinness and just, you know, the little quirks of hand spun yarn, especially when you're a fairly new beginner spinner. Um, I was nervous about how that would turn out in a finished product. And I think this was perhaps the best project possible for this. Obviously, all these yarns are slightly different weights. Some of them are more thick and thin. I'm thinking especially of this like lovely peach color here. This is a little bit chunky compared to the blues and greens and purples that I managed to spin nice and thin. So with that project all done, I mentioned that I was going to uh, do maybe a woven scarf and also a crocheted scarf and I have cast on, cast on, <laughs> I have warped my loom for this project. Gosh, I am always a knitter at heart and all the knitting words like word vomit come out of my mouth instead of the other crafts that they should be. But I did go ahead and take lots and lots of the leftover yarn from this project and I have warped up my loom. I believe this is the color that I did my warp and weft with and now that I'm looking at it off camera I know that I'm lying to you. I did about half of it with this color and half of it with the darker blue green color. Let's get it. This is going to be hard to appreciate but the background color on this little section. Uh, I used that until I ran out of yarn and then the rest of that blue green color. And then I started to weave. Um, for this project I decided that as a new weaver I wanted to tackle a new skill and I had never done uh, clasped, clasped weft weaving before. It's another one of those skills where it looked really difficult and then I spent maybe five minutes looking at a tutorial on YouTube and went, oh, this is really easy, and just jumped right into it. And I'm so glad that I did. It's turning out really, really lovely. Um, the first bit of weaving I did, I actually used this yarn, and then the second bit, this yarn. Now, these two are significantly different in weights. Let me see if I can pull this up so you can see that they are, um, you know, like a worsted weight versus a sport or fingering weight. And once I got into the lighter weight yarn, I really started to love the way the fabric was looking. 
And so I just made the decision to maybe skip some of those chunkier yarns for the rest of the project. So I am happy to say that in this bag of wonders, I have quite a few skeins of uh, finer spun yarn. I have quite a few skeins of thicker spun yarn too that I was planning on using. Uh, but I think I'm going to stick with these lighter, uh, lighter yarns for the remainder of the project. And I may just uh, kind of chomp off the end where the chunkier yarn was, just depending on how it looks when it's all finished and off the loom. Uh, I brought that all up here, but I will endeavor to just take some pictures because I don't think it's going to add anything to this video for me to haul this loom up and try to show it to you. But I'll take a couple of pictures. It's actually funny because as I was carrying the loom up the stairs and into my little recording space for the day, I forgot that it was a class weft project and that I had this extra ball of yarn that was sitting on the floor next to the loom. And so I picked up my loom and my shuttle and walked up the stairs, uh, kind of across the courtyard and into our, into my weaving, my uh, recording space and then realized that I had a ball of yarn that had trailed me the whole way. And so uh, I had some fun wrestling that yarn away from my littlest kitten as I went back to retrieve it. For my last bit of actual uh, crafty content this week, we delve into this project bag for my Orenberg lace shawl. So this is of course my Orenberg lace shawl that I uh, introduced to you in my last episode. I had not cast on this project yet and I have now. Um, I mentioned in the last episode that I was doing a workshop through the Interweave website called the Orenberg Warm Shawl. And this is a workshop about the lace knitting from the region of Orenburg, Russia. And it talks a lot about the history of the cottage knitting industry in that area. They're known specifically for two types of shawls, one of them called the Orenburg Warm Shawl and one of them called a Gossamer Web. The Gossamer Web shawls are um, traditionally knit with like a lace to cobweb weight yarn and then the warm shawls are a much thicker yarn, uh, like a fingering weight yarn. Uh, and both of these are knit with the goat fiber from the region, the Orenburg goats, and the warm shawls were traditionally plied with um, either silk or cotton, which I thought was really interesting. They would use the natural color from the goat and then they would dye the cotton to match that color and ply those together to make a little bit of a weightier yarn. This is not knit out of very expensive goat fiber. This is knit out of an alpaca yarn, which is left over from my failed weaving project that I talked about last week. Uh, this is Gist yarn and it's just lovely. I am enjoying working with it. Check this out. Cone of yarn. I don't know how you weavers have been keeping this under wraps for so long that you can buy giant cones of yarn for not that expensive. Uh, but now that I know about it, I think I'm going to be shopping more often on weaving websites. <laughs> if you're an experienced uh, weaver and knitter, maybe you can tell me why this yarn seems to be so much less expensive than it is from a knitting website. And I will believe you whatever you tell me. <laughs> anyway, so uh, while I've been working on this project, I like to deep dive down the rabbit hole and try to find any information I can on Orenburg Lace Knitting. It started with just a general, you know, search of the interweb, search of the YouTubes. So I have created a playlist, which I will link below, or you can access just through my channel's playlists on Orenburg Lace Knitting. I found a couple of, um, they were just general, they looked like they were news, news um, segments that were like highlighting the Orenburg region, the traditions of that region, the exports of that region, but of course they had to talk about Orenburg lace. And there was one that talked about the Orenburg lace shawl that orbited the world that they sent up into space with one of the astronauts and is now in a museum there in Orenburg. Uh, but I did also find this two and a half hour long video. It looks like a local yarn shop hosted a guest speaker and had a woman come in and talk for two and a half hours about Orenburg lace knitting. So if you want to deep dive down the rabbit hole of Orenburg lace, maybe go check that out. Um, yeah, it makes me realize that this is two and a half hours of knitting for me because I worked on it while watching that video. Um, whew. 
I'm thinking about one of the news segments that was um, that I linked below, and they showed a, a brief shot of one of the knitters working on her shawl, and she's just flying, like flying across the needles. And I keep thinking that maybe I need to um, work on the efficiency of my knitting, uh, efficiency of movement specifically. I do a lot of movement when I'm knitting. Uh, originally, I was a a thrower, you know, and then I did switch over to sort of a version of um, picking, but being that I taught myself, you know, it's maybe not the most efficient way of knitting and I can keep working on that. I may not practice that on this particular project though because every time I try my tension gets a little bit wonky. Um, anyway, all this to say, I have been working diligently on this project and it's going to take me a very long time to get it done. So this is actually the start of one of the borders. You make four of these total. So this is the increased row. Now that I've reached this wide, the border will be this wide and then I will knit straight until the border is complete. You make four of them and join them together, sort of like mitered squares coming together. Uh, you graph them together and then you knit the center, which is a big giant square. So I'm going to be working on this for a while and I thought, why not do some sort of a knit along while I work on it. I'm not going to ask you guys to tackle Orenburg lace. What I'm going to ask you to do is tackle a traditional project. So pick a region of the world or pick a particular style of knitting that you've always been interested in and go pick a traditional knitting. Uh, pattern, you don't necessarily have to knit it traditionally, but while you're working on your traditional or traditional inspired pattern, spend some time getting to know more about that tradition. What makes it distinct? What is the history of knitting in that region? Why do you think that this particular pattern or style developed out of this region? So for example, these, um, these types of shawls developed because of the availability of those Orenburg goats. Um, it's actually interesting. They're very similar to cashmere goats and they have actually tried to export these goats to other regions of the world and I think specifically they mentioned France and they found within one or two generations that the goats stopped producing as fine of a, a fiber and it's because of the climate of the region. So it, they need that very, very harsh winter to grow these lovely fine coats. And when they move them out of those harsh climates, they stop producing nice fiber. So just interesting facts about, you know, what's available to a region and why it becomes a thing. I think also as we work through these projects, I know it's going to take me a long time to work on this guy. So I might um, do some segments on other types of knitting. I've been thinking about the um, Koichan knitting, so the Pacific Northwest region of the United States and Canada, not the United States, Canada, <laughs> and uh, knitters in that region. Um, if you're struggling to think of what that style of knitting is, if you're a fan of the Big Lebowski, the dude, his sweater, the dude sweater, you can find lots of these on Ravelry, but those are traditional style sweaters of the Koichan um, knitters. Uh, I think maybe the next episode or two I'll dig into that style of knitting a little bit. Um, I do have a project that I did in the past that's vaguely inspired by the dude sweater, and I'll talk about that a little bit in my next episode. So yeah. We're going to call it tackling the, tra tackling the Traditions, and let's have this run into July. We'll give us lots of time to work on that, and I'll work on maybe putting together a little prize package. So if you want to knit along with us, share pictures or progress of what you're working on, or maybe share some of the knowledge that you've gained as you're working on your traditional knitting project, you can share those on Instagram at HaxtonKnitsMAL, or over on Ravelry at the Haxton Knits YouTube channel. Uh, this is actually all of my knitting content for the day. I'm going to dive into a little bit of life in Okinawa, but if you've enjoyed this, please, I would love it if you guys would like and subscribe. That helps me out greatly, and then you, of course, can get lots of updates as I continue to talk about these traditional knitting patterns. All right, so I picked my knitting back up so we can move on to the life in Okinawa section and maybe I can talk a little bit less rushed. 
Here in Okinawa, it is the end of the cherry blossom season. Um, you know, it's funny, I've lived here for so many years and I've never actively like sought out to go look at the cherry blossoms, but I did this year. Um, part of the reason I went out was because I was finally starting to feel better. So I, um, I got my second COVID vaccine shot and guys, it was a doozy. Um, the first one was fine, I felt great. The second one, I was definitely out of work the next day. So if you are getting your shots, um, plan that second shot to not, to not have to follow the next day with a day of work or you may be pretty miserable. Um, I did have like a fever and chills and I was really run down and out on the couch for the day. So the next day, I was finally feeling a little bit better. Actually, surprisingly, I woke up the next day and felt a lot better, like I felt really good. I went for a run in the morning and then with all my energy, I uh, went and decided to seek out some of the cherry blossoms before the end of the season. Uh, for us here in Okinawa, it's really late January and early February that you can see the cherry blossoms. And there's a certain region where they're really nice, which is up kind of north, uh, oh gosh, northwest. <laughs> Uh, north of Nago, around um, the Nago Castle Ruin site, and around um, a couple of the other castle ruins especially, there were a lot of cherry trees planted. So that's what I did on my day off this week. Um, it is a long drive up there for me, so it's about an hour drive up, so, and I just did it kind of on a whim, which was interesting, you know, I put my book and tape on and just went up. Um, and normally there is a road all the way up the hill to where the cherry blossoms are, but for some reason they were closed. So I had to walk up like 500,000 stairs. There's a beautiful little shrine at the top. Um, and then of course the whole way up the mountain is lined with cherry blossoms. So I will plug in tons and tons of pictures of this. Uh, Nago Castle Ruins. There's a big park there. It's actually right next to the Orion Beer Factory. That's how I remembered it, was I went on the beer factory tour and saw the signs for it. Uh, there aren't really castle ruins there anymore, not like the hundred other castle ruins on this island. If you're a big fan of looking at old uh, fortresses and old castles and things like that, uh, here in Okinawa there are quite a few ruin sites where there are at the very least some of the walls and little remaining bits of structure that you can go and check out but this particular site there's no more walls or buildings to be seen it's one of the earliest settled sites um, I know they found like pottery and tiles roof tiles and stuff that originated from China and from Korea all kind of around the 14th century that's when this site was settled there's some remaining trenches and things like that, but it's a really nice park. It's a good place to go spend some time and take pictures and look at cherry blossoms, <clears throat> but not necessarily the best place in Okinawa to go see some of the castle ruins in history. Um, gosh, of course, we had the Shuri Castle, which was a reconstructed, uh, beautifully reconstructed um, castle project that burnt down earlier last year. Um, I know they're trying to gather money to rebuild that now and that poor site I feel like it's burned down four times but anyway cherry blossom season I had a lovely day out uh, there were a lot of school kids out I tried very hard to go at a time when it wouldn't be very busy this was technically the end of the cherry blossom festival but I was there early in the morning on a work day so there weren't very many people around and of course there were the food vendors still out I was so excited okay street food is the best food in the world no matter where you are right and here in Okinawa there are always street food vendors set up for various events and there was one open even though it was very early and not a very popular time of day and I ended up getting these little um, it's a sweet potato like wrapped in kind of like a egg roll wrapper and fried it is so good <laughs> Here in Okinawa, the sweet potatoes are different than what I'm used to in the U.S. and I really love them in desserts and snacks and things like that. They're very, very good. Uh, so yeah, I picked up some street food and then went to my car to eat it because, you know, COVID. Um, <laughs> and otherwise had a very lovely day.
What else? I don't know what else. Uh, otherwise, I have been a giant lazy bum. I have been playing video games. Um, that was something that I was able to do while I was recovering from my surgery. <clears throat> now I'm totally hooked and addicted and uh, spending way too many hours doing that instead of my beloved knitting. So that has been life here in Okinawa. That is really all I have for you guys this week. Uh, as always, you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Haxton Knits, and I look forward to seeing you guys next week.